The title of this experiment is Solution Preparation and Visible Spectroscopy, and it's an opportunity for you to develop pipetting and dilution skills alongside making measurements to assess the absorption properties of a colored solute in a solution. So we're going to prepare a number of different solutions containing copper 2 ion at various concentrations, perform visible spectroscopy on those solutions, and assess the dependence of the maximum absorbance on concentration. And then we're going to apply that relationship between absorbance and concentration to the study of a chemical reaction that, at least in theory anyway, produces copper 2. And we'll be able to assess the time dependence of that reaction by following the absorbance over time. Our overarching goal in this experiment is to determine how the absorbance, the brightness, quote unquote, of aqueous copper 2 solution depends on the concentration or molarity of copper 2 in that solution, then apply that relation to a chemical reaction. In order to do that, we need to prepare solutions with precisely known and accurately done concentrations of copper 2 ion, and we're going to do that through the process of dilution. Now, I have a whole video on dilution and solution preparation that I'll link out to, just giving the basics here and keeping it in the context of the current experiment. So, we're going to start with a one molar solution of copper 2, aqueous solution, containing water as the solvent and copper 2 plus as the solute. This is the most concentrated solution we'll work with, and it's what we'll start with in doing dilutions. It's what's known as the stock or concentrate is another term you'll hear. It's also numbered with solution number one. We're going to dilute this to prepare a number of solutions that are lighter that have a weaker blue color, all the way down to 0.0, .0 molar copper 2, which will simply be deionized water. And the, each of these solutions has numbers. We'll need to do some calculations to figure out how much of the stock to add to prepare these diluted solutions at our target volumes. And the way that's done is to apply what's called the dilution equation. Now, I covered the dilution equation in detail elsewhere. The important point I'll make about it here is that by definition, dilution is a process that does not change the number of moles of solute dissolved in the solution. And so what the dilution equation expresses is a fundamental equality between the moles of solute before the dilution and the moles of solute after dilution. And all dilution is, is just adding additional solvent. So we're going to use some, some quantity of stock that we're going to calculate using this equation, and then we're going to top up to our target volume with deionized water. Ideally using volumetric glassware to do this, although depending on the scale, it's not always possible to use, for example, a volumetric flask to prepare a dilution. Now we have a series of copper solutions with precisely and accurately known concentrations of copper 2 ion, and we can move on to the spectroscopy of these solutions. Now, let's talk a little bit about spectroscopy. A spectroscopy experiment, a visible spectroscopy experiment, involves the following situation. We start with a solution. Say this is one of the six solutions from above, and we put it in what's called a cuvette. That cuvette goes into a device called a spectrometer or spectrophotometer that does the following. It impinges some input light on the sample with some intensity I0, and then it measures the output light after the light beam has passed through the sample at a certain distance. And that output light intensity is measured as I. It does this for a variety of different wavelengths of incoming and outgoing light that we'll abbreviate using the symbol lambda. And the full graph of the wavelength dependence of the intensity of light is what's known as a spectrum. So, Inside the instrument, inside your lab quest, what's called the absorbance is calculated. This is related to how much light is absorbed. You can imagine if the output light intensity is much lower than the input light intensity, this logarithm of I0 over I is going to be a pretty large number, and absorbance greater than 1 is quite, quite large. When we plot absorbance, as a function of the wavelength of light that is impinged on the sample and measured, we get what's called a spectrum. And a typical spectrum, typical visible or ultraviolet spectrum, is going to look something like this with one, maybe two peaks. Notice the range of wavelengths here, the visible range from about 400 nanometers to about 750 nanometers with purple light down here and red light up here. And the most important point on this graph for our purposes is the point where the absorbance is at a maximum. 
that's this point right here. And we can see that it's associated with a maximum absorbance, a max, and a wavelength of maximum absorbance known as lambda max for short. Lambda max is a very important wavelength for measurement purposes because it is the wavelength at which the absorbance measurement is most sensitive to changes in concentration. As we'll see, concentration is related to absorbance through a very simple relation, a linear relation in fact, and the slope of that line that relates absorbance and concentration is related to how tall the spectrum is essentially at the wavelength of interest. And this is the tallest point on the spectrum, and so it's the most sensitive wavelength for using absorbance to measure concentration. That's why we focus on it. Now, let's dive a little bit more deeply into the dependence of absorbance on the molarity of our solute. Here it's copper two. On the slide, I represented it as the molarity of a generic molecule or compound M. What is the dependence of A on the molarity of M? Well, this is encapsulated in what's called the Beer-Lambert Law, or more, more colloquially, just Beer's Law. So again, let's imagine, to get a handle on this dependence, what would a graph look like if we plotted absorbance as a function of molarity? And more specifically, let's focus in on that most sensitive wavelength, looking at the absorbance at lambda max, we previously called that A max, as a function of the molarity of M for a wide variety of solutes under a wide variety of conditions, particularly relatively dilute conditions, a linear relationship is observed here with a greater concentration corresponding to greater ab absorbance. And intuitively, you probably know this from everyday life. The stock will be a deeper color than these diluted solutions, and that corresponds to a greater absorbance in the solutions containing more dissolved copper two ions. So this is pretty intuitive. Now, let's dive into this line a little bit deeper because we can break the equation of this line down into a somewhat more detailed form that's quite illuminating. So the equation of the line is going to relate A and M, and it does so through a slope that incorporates two important parameters related to the experiment and the compound in question. So we have A is equal to the molarity of M times a constant called epsilon times L. Now, L is simply the path length of the light beam through the sample. For our purposes, this will always be one centimeter, and so it will get folded into the units of epsilon, but otherwise, we can completely ignore it. Now, what is epsilon? Epsilon is, ignoring the path length again, the proportionality constant between the absorbance and the molarity, and it's known as the molar absorptivity or molar absorptivity coefficient, molar absorption constant, all of these names are used. It's a measure of how much light the sample absorbs at one mole per liter is one way to think about it. Molar absorptivity is largest at lambda max, and I'll let you think through that, but the idea is if absorbance is at a maximum at that point, then epsilon must also be at a maximum at that wavelength point. The units of molar absorptivity, if we think about the units here, A is dimensionless, and so the units must entirely divide out on the right-hand side. This means that molar absorptivity has units of inverse molarity, moles per liter to the negative one, or molar to the negative one, and inverse length. And if we're talking one centimeter, it's easiest to use inverse centimeters here. And molar absorptivity provides us with an extremely convenient way to relate absorbance to concentration, because now, as long as I know the path length, which I will from my device, I can measure absorbance and calculate concentration directly using that known molar absorptivity. So in the first part of the experiment, we will direct our attention towards determining the molar absorptivity by taking spectra of these six solutions of known concentration and looking at the absorbance at lambda max. And then later on in the experiment, we will apply this equation to measure copper two as it is generated in a chemical reaction, looking at the time dependence of the reaction. This is something you'll do at a higher level in chemical principles two, chem 1212. Here, we're just introducing ourselves to the idea that we can apply absorbance spectroscopy and visible spectroscopy to measure concentrations. One last important point I'll mention here is that when you actually do this in the laboratory, you'll get, of course, a series of data points. You'll build a line of best fit. That line of best fit is extremely unlikely to pass directly through zero. And so it's going to include some error term. Let's call it delta. 
And this error term is very important to include when you apply this equation, for example, to following the formation of copper two in a chemical reaction. It's important to include because it encapsulates errors in the experimental design within the spectrometer and things that can very easily translate from the first part of the experiment where we're measuring Beer's law to the second part of the experiment where we're applying Beer's law. And so do include that error term in all of your calculations as you're calculating concentrations from absorbance measurements in the last part of the experiment.